Hi, this is Heidi Burgess, and I want to talk about John Paul's Letterox uh, exercise, which I call, I'm not sure he calls it this, but I call it the meeting place. I'll explain why I call it that in a minute. This was an exercise that John Paul first developed when he was working in Nicaragua in the late 1980s. He was there as a Mennonite peace builder, and he was working with some Moravian and the Baptist churches, uh, trying to act as a facilitator with their uh, conciliation teams that were trying to resolve the conflict between the Sandinista government and the East Coast resistance. He writes up this story in numerous places uh, one of them is his book, Journey Towards Reconciliation, uh, which has a chapter called The Meeting Place, which is where I got the name for the exercise. And one of the things that he talks about in that chapter, and in many other places, in many of his writings, is that his work in Nicaragua helped him learn to see conflicts in new ways through a new set of lenses. And different lenses is a metaphor that he uses in Building Peace, and he uses it in Moral Imagination, and he uses it in his lectures. And it's very powerful. Uh, he talks about new ways of seeing what's going on. On page 51 of Journey Towards Reconciliation, he explains that through their eyes, he meant the participants in these conciliation conferences, I saw beyond conflict resolution to reconciliation. What's the difference? Well, he explains that conflict resolution focuses on issues and problems, while reconciliation focuses on mending relationships. And the chapter of the meeting place and the exercise on the meeting place focuses on just exactly what this means and how it can be done. He tells in his story that the conciliation teams almost always started their meetings with a reading of Psalm 85. This is a psalm where the writer pleads for the Lord, uh, pleases excuse me, pleas to the Lord for peace, righteousness, and well-being. In the Spanish version, which is somewhat different from the English version, in verse 10, uh, he says, four voices are called forth. They say, truth and mercy have met together, justice and peace have kissed. Lederach goes on to explain that the psalmist treats the concepts as if they were alive. Quoting directly from the book, he says, I could hear their voices in the war in Nicaragua. In fact, I could hear their voices in any conflict. Truth, mercy, justice, and peace were no longer just ideas. They became people, and they could talk. And this is the fundamental idea that gave rise to the exercise that he used multiple times with the disputants in Nicaragua. And he's used it in conferences among conflict resolvers and disputants in other countries. And it is such a powerful exercise that many other people have used it. I have used it a lot of times in classes and in conferences and in workshops. And the outcome of the exercise differs in significant ways every time. But every time, people say it's incredibly powerful. And they learned a lot from it. And I've actually done it myself with John Paul facilitating it three times. And I've learned new things from it every time. So it's a wonderful exercise and I want to explain some more about it. What he does is he breaks people into groups. There's one group for truth, there's one group for mercy, 
one for justice and one for peace. And they meet separately. The first question he asks all of the groups is, what are you most concerned with in the midst of conflict? Now, when I've done this with him, he doesn't tend to give a context. He doesn't say what conflict, but rather conflict in general. Sometimes I do it that way, and sometimes when I'm working with students, I give them a particular conflict to think about. Right now when I'm doing it, I'm looking at the conflict between conservatives and liberals in the United States, where truth, mercy, peace, and justice are all very much apparent, very important issues to the people on all sides. Fleshing out the question of what are you most concerned with, I usually ask the groups to think about what do they need? Who do they need it from? How do they know when they have it? Who can help them get it? And who, meaning which of these other people or groups, are they most afraid of? Then Lederach and I give the groups about 20 to 30 minutes to chew on these questions. They're not easy. And for the students who think they are easy, I come and ask some probing questions and they immediately figure out that it isn't as simple or as easy as they thought it was. And then I ask each group to choose a spokesperson who I bring up or Lederach brings up into the center of the room and he mediates a conversation between them. For instance, in the one that's described in Journey Towards Reconciliation, he starts out talking to truth. And he observes, when I talk to one side, like these people over here, they say that you are with them. And when I talk to the others, like our friends over there, they claim you are on their side. Yet in the middle of all this pain, you seem to come and go. Is there only one truth? And that, of course, gets at one of the stumbling blocks that students, particularly beginning students, tend to fall into, thinking that facts are facts, truth is truth, and it's very easy to tell the difference. It isn't. Which leads Lederach to ask later in the conversation recorded in the book, why are you so hard to find? And later he asks, as I do, who are you afraid of? In the version given in the book, Truth was afraid of mercy. Mercy in the book was a man, but in my pictures here, she was a woman, so I changed the um, gender in this quote. But Truth said, in her haste to heal, she covers my light and clouds my clarity. She forgets that forgiveness is our child, not hers alone. This brings in a metaphor that if it doesn't come up automatically, Lederach brings up himself during the conversation, and he asks, who comes first? And he names these people great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, and children. And you can get into really interesting discussions because people will claim that peace and mercy are twins and the parent is justice, or justice and truth are twins and the parent is peace, and you get many, many different ways, lots of disagreements, lots of interesting conversations about who comes first who is required for the other to appear, and so on. As I said, truth was afraid of mercy, but it turns out that mercy was afraid of justice. Lederach asked justice in the book, 
everybody in this room feels that they have been wronged and most are willing to justify their actions, even their violent deeds, as doing your bidding. Is that not true? And then justice has to explain how he isn't the enemy of peace, how he isn't the enemy of mercy, and perhaps how he isn't the enemy of truth, although most often justice and truth see themselves as allies more than peace and mercy do. Now that's another question that I ask and Lederach asks too, that I'm not sure that I put in the slideshow, which is, who is your who are your best allies and who are your enemies or who are you afraid of is essentially the same question. And again, every time I do the exercise, the answers are different. But the bottom line is that there's four concepts, truth, justice, peace, and mercy, it's not clear what any of them mean. It's not clear how any of them are obtained. It's not clear which comes first, which later, which needs the other, which opposes the other. So there are many paradoxes but Lederach says the solution, if you'll accept that term, is what you get when you mediate and negotiate between these four concepts and you get them to recognize l the legitimacy and the importance of each other and give up some things in order to get some things and ultimately, if you can bring all four together, you can get to the meeting place of reconciliation. Now, as I say, I use this exercise in almost every class I teach because I think it is so powerful and it illustrates so many complexities related to each of these concepts, which is often considered to be simple. And it can be applied, as Lederach says, to pretty much any conflict. So it can be used as an exercise independent of conflicts. It can be used as a way of analyzing a particular conflict. It be, can be used as a theory upon which to analyze action. It can be used as an intervention tool, which in fact is the way Lederach ended up using it in Nicaragua. It's just many faceted and extremely powerful. And uh, we will be pulling these ideas frequently in both the Fundamentals and the Frontier Seminar because they're so central and so important. Thanks.